Welcome to Fintech Daydreaming. The podcast that dives into the world of banking technologies and the ever-changing landscape of fintech companies. We bring you real-life examples from global and local thought leaders, as well as experts working within the financial industry, and seek out the best stories from the front lines of financial services innovation, where dreams of industry pioneers meet reality. Hosted by Paul Krogdahl and Ville Sontu. This is Fintech Daydreaming. Hello and welcome back to Fintech Daydreaming. My name is Ville Sointu and I will be your host for today's episode of our Fintech Goodness podcast that is uh, getting more and more listeners every day as we speak. But I'm, I'm of course joined as always by my partner in non-financial crime, Paul Krugdahl. So uh, Paul, how are you today? I'm, I'm, I would like to say that I'm good, Villa, but um, as we discussed in the last episode, winter has rapidly come here to Finland. I was forced to uh, take upon the challenge of changing my car's wheels to winter wheels, and my body decided to demonstrate to me that I'm getting old. I tore a, a something in my arm. I feel like I'm getting to an age where I need to start getting my son to do these jobs rather than myself. But apart from that, I'm I'm good. Yeah. Oh, good to hear. I mean, uh, on the kind of topic of getting old, uh, I, I flew back from Vegas from Money 2020 just last week. And uh, well, as it, the second I landed home, I got this terrible flu, which I'm still kind of suffering. So if you if my voice sounds a little bit uh, rusty, <laughs> it's because of this uh, flu that I'm enjoying right now. But uh, it's good to get these things out of the way before the holiday season starts. So uh, we'll be all healthy and in good energy for uh, for the holiday season time. Absolutely. All right, good. But let's uh, get on with the show. Uh, and uh, today is one of those shows when I should say that uh, the uh, our guest needs no introduction, but we're going to do the introduction anyway. <laughs> so our guest today is uh, uh, Sangeet Paul Chaudhary, who is the founder of Platformation Labs and the author of the book Better, I should say, best-selling book, Platform Revolution. Uh, again, we are big fans of the book. We're big fans of San, uh, Sangeet, and we are so happy to have you on the podcast. How are you, Sangeet? I'm doing great. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Great. Uh, and again, uh, this uh, it, it almost feels like this uh, superstar moment for us uh, here at the podcast. We've had many great guests, but uh, again, not too many best-selling authors. Uh, so that's uh, that's uh, I think it's a first uh, for us uh, at, the, at the moment. But good. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about, of course, your uh, work so far with the platform revolution, but also looking forward a little bit on on what is next for you and uh, what are your kind of new thinking based on all the, all the discussions and all the work that you've been doing based on your book. Uh, and uh, we'll get all to all of that very soon. But uh, so again, maybe uh, just as a starter, maybe you can introduce yourself. So what got you into this uh, uh, work, a line of work for platforms and, uh, and how, do you, how, do you, how did you become you? Uh, well, I started my career in big tech, uh, you know, around the global financial crisis around that time. Um, and uh, one of the first uh, issues that I started looking at as part of my work was uh, whether, you know, there was a fundamentally different business model we were moving to with software. Um, because uh, a lot of tech companies, I mean, forget Google and Facebook, but a lot of tech companies that time were still in the business of selling software, right? And uh, they were in the business of uh, uh, charging for actual actual software. We still had not entered the period where we were charging for data uh, and we were giving software away for free. So that was, you know, that was the cusp at which I was trying to make sense of what was happening. And a lot of people were kind of framing this as, you know, we're moving away from, um, you know, uh, desktop to cloud, that was part of the shift, yes. Uh, we are moving away from software to data, that was part of the shift. But there was a bigger shift uh, wrapping all of this together. And, and that's what kind of really got me thinking in terms of what's the really big shift that's happening in business models. It's not just a shift from where the software sits or how the so or, or where you make money, it's, it's all of it, right? And that's uh, what kind of got me uh, uh, you know, deeper into thinking about it. And uh, I, I ended up crafting this whole story around, well, the real shift is is not necessarily from desktop to cloud. It's not necessarily uh, just from 
you know, uh, making money on software to giving software for free and making money on data. There's a bigger shift across industries and software kind of underpins all of it, but the real shift is from pipelines to platforms. And if I just uh, could explain that in one line, uh, the idea of a pipeline is traditional business models in the industrial era have always worked on this model of build something, ship it out, send it down the pipeline and somebody buys it at the other end, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and software also worked that way. If you look at Microsoft, if you look at uh, any of the software uh, businesses back in the 80s, 90s, and even today SaaS businesses, if you will, it's about build SaaS, ship SaaS, sell SaaS, right? But we were coming into a different business model era where the role of software no longer was to be the product, but to be something else, uh, which allowed interactions between other players and help them work together and build on top of it. And that that's the key idea that we move away from the pipeline model to a platform model where your business as a company is really to act as an infrastructure and a governance mechanism to enable third-party interactions and coordination around yourself. And that was the key uh, insight that kind of kicked off uh, my work over the past decade. It, it's interesting. I mean, when we're talking about banking in particular, banking is and always has been a fundamentally pipeline-based business. Banks create banking products that they then provide to consumers. I would assume if we look at this from a, a banking perspective, it's a fundamentally difficult proposition for traditional bankers to understand that transition from a pipeline based model to a platform based model. Do, do you have any simplistic examples from other industries that could maybe help to put that in position for for the banking industry? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, uh, I'll, I'll answer that question in two parts, right? Uh, the first part, which which you uh, framed as banking being a largely pipeline business is a very interesting part of, uh, it's a really interesting topic uh, because um, banking professionals themselves are divided on whether they see themselves as pipeline or platform. And I'll explain why, because one of the key ideas about a platform business is that you're able to scale with assets that are not necessarily your own, but are third party assets. So think of Airbnb, you don't own the rooms, but you're able to scale because third parties, essentially hosts provide rooms, guests book rooms. And so uh, you're able to scale without scaling up your internal assets. Now, a lot of banks think that they are pipelines because uh, they are pushing out banking products, but there, there's another set of banking executives who say, well, we are platforms because we are building off the deposits that are coming from third parties and we are driving those deposits into loans for uh, you know, the demand side. And so it's not fundamentally too different. Um, now, it's important to understand that just because you sit in the middle of an interaction does not automatically make you a platform. Uh, you could sit in the middle of an interaction and still be just sourcing deposits, bundling them into products and pushing them out through a pipeline. And that's exactly where you were going. That's exactly to some extent what they do. Um, in order for you to successfully be a platform, you really need to benefit from uh, you know, the, the interactions that happen around you and are scaling without you necessarily having to scale your ability to, um, you know, um, grow as an organization to enable that. And uh, I'll I'll just give a simple example in terms of how this uh, plays out in different industries. Uh, obviously, Airbnb is an example that I gave of an example that or an example that's that's well understood, if you will. Um, there, there are, uh, you know, tons of other uh, scenarios where we see a traditional pipeline model versus a platform model. Think of uh, a staffing company, which typically hires people and then uh, you know, leases out those people to clients versus think of a freelancing platform like Upwork, which does not hire those professionals, connects them to the stakeholders who want to work with them. Now, the key difference between that type of a platform and an Airbnb kind of a platform uh, versus the banking example is that platforms fundamentally provide the infrastructure on which these markets can develop. How do these markets develop? One simple way for a market to develop is by building trust not in the platform itself, but in the market participants, right? So in Airbnb, you trust Airbnb. Yes, Airbnb covers you with insurance. But the real reason you engage in a transaction is because you see a five-star rated host. So there's a trust in a market participant created as well. With banks, they're still working pipeline. They're not creating trust in the market. They're creating trust in themselves. And that's what's helping them scale the pipeline. So a key issue here is to really understand, do you empower market 
interactions or do you just sit in the middle and empower an organizational form of value creation? Uh, that's, I think, is, is one of the key tests. I'll get to a second test of a, a platform business model, which is equally interesting, but I'll pause here uh, at this point. Great. Uh, now that we kind of successfully built the bridge from, uh, from the kind of platform thinking in general into financial services and fintech, uh, I know our audience is expecting one thing. And the one thing is the joke that we always do in the, in the podcast. So even at the risk of pausing the discussion for a moment, I'm going to ask, do you have a maybe fintech related joke that would kind of get us a nice segue to the follow up questions uh, that we have around here? But I'm just going to break the, the mold a bit here because this is not, not traditionally a joke, but to me, the biggest joke is uh, when consultants come to a bank and say, you need to stop being a bank and you need to become a tech company, you need to become a platform company, or when people say every, every company is going to be a tech company. Well, every company needs tech, but that does not mean that you abandon your existing profit pools and you abandon your existing ways of making money. You have to figure out how tech helps you defend your existing position and then leveraging that branch out into new positions and i think that's that's you know if you're a banking executive and a lot of innovation enthusiasts inside banking go to the head of risk and say we need to stop being a bank that's not you know a conversation that's going to go anywhere so i think that's the key uh, principle over here that any transformation you know technology will keep changing you you had you you've had cloud you've had mobile now you have you know generative ai you'll have another technological shift with every shift you need to figure out where is value shifting and how does it impact your profit pool? You don't just say our profit pools worked in the past. Now we're going to find a new profit pool. So I think to me, you know, I've gone now way beyond the joke, but, but to me, that's a recurring joke when I enter into any room with banking executives and somebody asks me, do we have to abandon being a bank? What do, what are we in the future? Yeah. Does it sound familiar, Paul? What do you think? <laughs> well, you know, as, as a consultant, I resonate very strongly with what you're, you're just saying, and it is a fantastic joke. I mean, I've, I'm one of the, the people who who absolutely believe that banks should not be a technology company with a banking license. They should leave technology to the technology experts and focus on being a bank, particularly as they're being heavily disrupted. So I, I fully agree with you and I understand it as a joke very well. Yeah, and uh, as a recovering banker myself, I can totally relate. Uh, the amount of consultants that came to the bank and said that exact thing is uh, is staggering, I can tell you that. Yeah. Uh, there is one exception to the rule, though. I mean, if you actually are a tech company and then you do, do actually acquire a banking license, then that's a debate that we can have. But if we're for the kind of incumbent banks, yeah, if you're setting up yourself for, uh, for uh, a losing proposition, if you try to become Google uh, suddenly uh, after being a bank for 100 years plus, so... <laughs> But it does actually lead us into a, a follow on discussion on, on this, which is, you know, what is the role then of the banks as they move into a platform paradigm or a platform based uh, future? How, how do you see this, Sangit, when, when you're talking yeah. to the banks and, and the growth of platforms, they have to figure out a strategy on how they're going to operate and engage in the future of, of a platform dynamic? Exactly. So I think, you know, I'll start with exactly what you said. We need to understand that every company does not have to become a platform, but every single company needs to understand how it will play in the platform economy. So every company needs a strategy for the platform economy, even if it's not becoming a platform. I think that's a starting point where we need to start because whether, you know, whatever you are in the value chain, you're either building on platforms somewhere down the line, or you are going to market through platforms somewhere up the line, right? Either through APIs or through third-party platform distributors, et cetera. But essentially, you need to have a strategy for the platform economy. Now, in order to kind of think through what, what is the role of, or how should banks, I'll, I'll just frame the question as how should banks position themselves for the platform economy, right? How do you position yourself for success when things are shifting towards the platform economy? Um, it's, I'll take an example from a different industry because uh, it's important to understand that the startups don't always win. The incumbents also win in certain cases. And you need to understand where the startups win and where the incumbents win. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of this narrative of startups win has kind of come through because uh, you know the shift to cloud and the shift to mobile uh, led to fundamentally different uh, you know, industry power structure. And if I, what, what I mean by that is when you move from cloud to SaaS, for instance, 
uh, sorry, from from uh, you know uh, traditional on-premise software to cloud, for instance, and desktop to SaaS. It was difficult for the incumbents to move in this direction because it required a full rebuild of everything. It required a fundamentally new technological architecture. With most transformations, that's not required. So in most transformations, the incumbent is well positioned to win if they understand one simple insight. And that is that when you are coming into a new transformation, when you're coming into a new technological wave, you need to see how can you use that to strengthen your existing position better. And a very good example of that is what happened with the shift to IoT, uh, okay? Um, when you think of where I started our conversation with the, the software is going to be given at zero price and we'll make money on the data and that's how Google and Facebook and a lot of other players operate. Uh, the IoT startups try to do the same thing. They try to give the device away for free and they try to make money on the data by charging for the data analytics, et cetera. But all of them ended up failing because what ended up happening was that the device performance did matter. And because the device performance mattered, there was a cost to the device. You can give software for free because the marginal cost of software is zero, but the marginal cost of a device is not zero. And so what ended up happening was all these startups did the product market fit. They burned venture capital to figure out what is resonating. But then the big guys, the, the Johnson controls, the Schneider Electrics, they made all the money because they had good devices and now they knew which analytics worked and they just bundled the two and they charged for the device and the analytics was free. So if you're a bank, think of it that way. How can you? How can I think about complementary pieces around my core product, which are being validated right now in the market and are being charged for, but if I could bundle them with my core product and subsidize that and hence protect my core product, how would that work out? And one of the ways to think about that is to really think of what's bundleable around your core product. And this is where the, uh, you know, some con uh, ideas of embedded banking come in because fundamentally banks sell a secondary product. They sell a secondary demand. You don't wake up in the morning thinking of getting your mortgage. You wake up in the morning dreaming of a house, right? So your primary demand is for the house. It's for the car. It's for, you know, um, I don't know, uh, in, in certain cultures like India, it's for your daughter's wedding. Uh, the secondary demand is for the loan, right? And so the loan or the mortgage will get commoditized by whoever owns the primary demand. Mm -hmm. So if we take that IoT example again, if you're a bank, you want to find a way to play in the primary demand, but you're not going to say, I'm not going to make money on the loan, I'm going to make money over there. What you want to do is figure out a way to play in the primary demand so that you can own that and through that, protect your loan business and commoditize the other players. And if you don't do that, at some point, somebody else will do that and you'll get commoditized because we're in a constantly connected attention economy and the primary demand is where a lot of the value sits. So I think, you know, that's one of the ways. I mean, there are other ways across the value chain to apply the same principles, uh, but I'll just pause there to, you know, keep the discussion going and, and come back to some of those issues as we move forward. I actually so have a, a quick follow-on question on that. I have so, several, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I have a quick one and you can take over after that, Vila. One of the fundamental elements of, of successful platforms is understanding and defining your value units for exchange. Mm -hmm. And particularly when you look at banks, the traditional value units, like we said, that shift from pipeline to platform gets very muddy and broken when banks are trying to understand what are the value units that we need to deliver against on, on any ecosystem platform. And that's a discussion I've got involved in quite often with banks. I'd, I'd be very interested in, you know, I've heard you very often talking about the critical element of being able to not only define your value units, but explain what the value units are. From a bank's perspective, how do you take that discussion? How do you help banks to understand the focus of value units rather than just traditional revenue? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, when I started talking about platforms, a little more than 10 years back, uh, I needed to anchor that discussion on something. And that's why I came up with the concept of the value unit, because people did not understand, or it was not intuitive in 2012 to think about what's the interaction in the market, what's happening in the market versus what's happening in your business. Today, it is intuitive because platform startups have scaled up, platform businesses, big tech, everything has happened. But the key idea of a value unit is this, shift the focus away from who you are as a bank or as a, any company, think about what is the larger market within which you operate. What gives you the right to play in that market? 
What are the key decisions your stakeholders are making in that market? And in order to make that key decision, what are the key value units that are being transferred, right? And so that's the starting point. And in order to look at that, if you're a bank, and let's take the mortgage example again, are you really in the business of securing deposits and setting mortgages? Or are you in the business of helping users in their home journey uh, by plugging in a mortgage at the right point? What exactly is your business? Once you define the boundaries of your business, if you feel, well, we're in the home journey, let's get more specific. Are you uh, in the home journey at the point of looking for a home, at the point of buying a home, at the point of owning and operating a home, renting a home, or eventually selling a home? Let's get specific. And then once we've defined where exactly we play, what's the primary driver of value over there? I'll give a simple example. If you're at the point at which you bought a home and you want to, you know, you want to serve the homeowner at the point where they've just purchased a home, a typical use case is going to be they want to really renovate the home, remodel the home. So in that case, in order to get to the value unit, you need to digitize the home's interiors. You need to have a clear view of what needs to be the model, what needs to be, uh, you know, structured. Because once you have created that, then you can get interior designers plugged into that. You can get uh, parts manufacturers plugged into that. You can get contractors plugged into that. Everyone can plug into that central value unit. Uh, so, you know, that that's that's one example. And if you look at house.com, that they probably do something like that. But if you're a, finance, a you know banking player and you say, well, the rest of the journey is crowded, I want to get in here, that's how I would go in over there. Versus if you say, I want to get in right at the beginning when people are dreaming about a home, right? At that point, the value unit is going to be very different. It's going to be maybe help me find the best neighborhood. So really digitizing that kind of information and creating a, a community where people can rank different neighborhoods on different uh, parameters. So if you really think of it, you know, some something like Nextdoor is doing that. My point being that in, in, in a platform economy, your mortgage could be sold through Nextdoor, it could be sold through House, it could be sold through Zillow, it could be sold through a whole myriad of different players with vastly different use cases, all centered around some part of the home buying and ownership journey. And so that's why you need to be very clear. You might be selling mortgage, who's your target customer and which part of the journey are you serving? And at that point, what's the key market interaction that will help you narrow down into the value unit. That's really, really interesting framing to the to the question that I want to ask. Uh, I want to circle back to something you said uh, in the earlier answer, which was that not every company needs to be a platform. Uh, um, mm -hmm. They don't need to be, nor they should be. Uh, shouldn't they be uh, a platform? So, in context of banking, uh, the we've had so many discussions on the podcast earlier about what we call embedded finance or embedded banking, which in my mind in this world really is the distribution of banking services into platforms. Now, these, these platforms can be uh, another, another discussion we've been having many times, basically like super apps. So if you have like the WeChats, the Alibabas uh, of the world, Klarna to a certain extent, Revoluts uh, in the world of fintech, those are the super apps. Now, I know we have a lot of listeners who are working in banks and they're thinking about their strategy in terms of, well, not only embedded finance, but the question that they have is that should we become a super app? Uh, and the, um, the, qu the question then is that if we rephrase it in the discussion that we've been having here so far is that should we become a platform, uh, should we become the super app provider or, or the distributor, or should we kind of uh, stay, stay back and uh, be happy with the embedded finance proposition. So what do you think? I mean, I'm sure there are a lot of regional differences for banks when they're try trying to make these decisions, but do you, is there some kind of criteria that uh, they should be thinking about uh, whether in making these decisions on when they, whether they should become platforms or not? Uh, absolutely. So, you know, I I'm, I'm going to take a, a slightly uh, provocative position over there because uh, my, my position is that uh, there is actually only one successful super app in the world today, and that is WeChat. And I'll explain what, what I mean by that. Okay, uh, everybody else is trying to be a super app. Um, a super app is not something that just bundles multiple apps together. A super app is something that owns the right to run all those functions so that if you're a banking super app, your customer should not have another banking app on your phone at all. If they do, you're not really a banking super app. You're just a single app that has three more functionalities. That's not a super app. You know, the reason WeChat is a super app uh, and, and why it's so powerful is because in China, people don't 
you know, WeChat is is the real layer at which apps decide. What I mean by that is people in China open their phone, they get into WeChat, and then they open other apps from there. They communicate, they run payments, everything happens in WeChat to the extent that Apple had to, you know, constantly do business development with WeChat to keep on asking them to implement every new update to iOS because when they changed something in iOS, until WeChat made that change, the app sitting inside WeChat could not benefit from those changes. So you understand the key difference, right? The reason we call Apple the platform layer is because apps run on top of it. And so if Apple improves iOS, the apps improve. But now in China, WeChat is the platform layer. Or, and the reason it's a super app is because it owns the right to then other apps on top of it. The reason it was able to do that Again, this is another, uh, you know, controversial or provocative insight that I'll just throw out there, is that WeChat was not simply the number one communication app that also happened to do payments. Look for, uh, you know, for to be a super app, the first thing is you need to have both the ability to um, manage workflow and have the right of uh, relationship with the user. So you are the place the user goes to daily for that bucket of use cases, right? Um, it's it's not just, you know, um, so you need to have that workflow and you need to have the right to manage payments. WeChat was not just the number one communication payments, uh, communication app that also had payments or the number one payments app that also had communication. It was both the number one communication app in China and arguably the number one payments app in China alongside Alipay. I mean, sometimes it was them, sometimes Alipay. Because it was number one at both, it was able to become the super app. So my problem with, you know, a, a grab or, a, you know, one of these Uber competitors becoming a super app is that they don't have the right to own those use cases. If I'm a user, I might do certain things through Grab, but I might also do it outside it. So at that point, you're not a super app, you're just an app bundle. And so that's my key distinction. We need to be very clear. If we want to be like WeChat, what does it take to be a super app versus just be an app bundle? And so from with that definition in place, right? I don't think a lot of these super apps are really successful as super apps. They are merely one core functionality with 10 adjacent functionalities bundled together, uh, which is not a bad position. It's a good position, but we should understand that it will not give you the market power that uh, a WeChat will give you. So I, I think that's one piece that I just want to bring out that, you know, if you really are serious about being a super app, you should ask yourself, do you have the right to become the default layer that which all banking functionalities will play for the user going forward? So that's one piece. And th that to me is the starting point of if you are able to get that kind of leadership, then you are in a unique position. You own the customer's banking relationship. You are top of mind. You are their go-to banking position. That's the position WeChat has. If you get there, more power to you and you know you will, you will win that game, right? In most cases, you will not get there. And that's where embedding finance co comes in, right? Embedded finance comes in because uh, you need to not just... You know, there are, there are two ways to win in the platform economy. If you are able to win close to the user, the way to win is you own the right to serve the user, right? Uh, I mean, Google, Facebook, these guys have won because they've owned the right to serve the user on that use case. If you're able to do that, that's great. If you're not able to do that, you need to realize that the rest of the value chain in the platform economy is built around API-based distribution. And so you need to be in a position to distribute yourself at scale. But there are two ways to distribute yourself. If you just distribute your functionality at scale without a way to defend your unique position, you will become a commodity. There'll be 10 other people like you. Everybody will be distributing at scale. Very soon, it'll become a price war on the API uh, uh, price, and it'll be a business development war. Nobody's going to win there. You need to have a key control position when you're distributing at scale. And a very good example of that is Stripe. If you look at Stripe, it could have just been a commoditized payment functionality that everybody was embedding and they would have been first to market and everybody would have used it. But then 10 years later, somebody else would have come slashed their price because of venture capital funding and they would have been second to market and then become the leader. But the reason Stripe continues to be in that position is because they have a control point. They distributed themselves through third party platforms. They put themselves in Lyft and Shopify, et cetera. But at the same time, they ensured that they owned the merchant relationship. I mean, just like, you know, as a super app, you need to be the player to own the customer relationship. 
as an embedded function and with embedded functionality, you need to either own the merchant relationship or some, some key relationship in the ecosystem. And so Stripe today is the only company that knows that you are running a shop on Shopify, but also driving Lyft at night because it's managing your payments across both. That's a control point. Without that, you get into an API price commoditization game. And so, you know, I just want to call these two things out because until you look for the control point, you are kind of doing innovation theater without really building the right business model. It's so, interesting. You, you, you've pulled me into the book, right? Um, remembering back into reading the book, you, you, you're picking up on two things that, that really stuck to me when I read the book. The one is around stickiness, defining what is your stickiness to, to retain the customer. The other one as well is around, you know, multi-homing. You, you talk in yeah. the book quite a lot about multi-homing. And I think you use the 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 game machines uh, as, as a good example and VHS and Betamax. I, th yeah. I think there's this critical elements here about being able to not only just drive the stickiness, but also to prevent multi-homing. And super apps there, the way you defined it to me was a prime example of multi-homing. Absolutely. So uh, Andy... Absolutely. Yeah, and with all, for all the banks with the super app dreams, uh, we can all do a callback now to the joke we did in the beginning. Uh, you're not going to be Google. Uh, you probably are not going to do a super app either. So I think this uh, we're seeing a recurring theme here for sure. Uh, I also picked up another uh, word you just mentioned uh, in your previous answer, which was basically the unbundling and bundling, uh, rebundling of things. And this moves us to the next stage of the uh, of the discussion because you've done a lot of work uh, after your uh, book came out uh, around this. Uh, the concepts of bundling and unbundling. So, especially in the context of digital services, this is a, a really interesting phenomenon to to uh, observe. So maybe you can elaborate a little bit and make a bit of an introduction yeah. to this uh, topic. Absolutely. So, you know, when the book came out in 2016, uh, big tech antitrust action was just starting. And so around that time, regulators started reaching out to me to understand these ideas in terms of when are these big tech companies actually amassing market power and when are they not, you know, when should we regulate them versus not. So helping create frameworks uh, for them to understand it. And that's what kind of got me interested in the idea of unbundling and rebundling. Uh, if you look at financial services, right, I mean, it becomes very really interesting over there. In general, unbundling disrupts the current industry structure, okay? But it does not lead to sustainable companies with wildly profitable value pools and sustainable, uh, successful, uh, you know, long-term value creation. If you look at a lot of fintechs that started out in the 2010s, they started by unbundling. They would start take one function of the bank and reimagine that and just deliver that as a full company, right? But the successful ones always use that unbundling to get to that place to, to get to that control point. So that, you know, going back to your point, it, then the multi-homing piece is key over there. You get to a control point only when there's no multi-homing. That means that you have established that dominance. So you use your unbundling vertical play to compete with, you know, a confused horizontal player like a bank uh, which is doing multiple things. Uh, you use your unbundling to compete with them, get access to customers, and then you rebundle from there and get only the right critical capabilities around that bundle. So if you look at Stripe, for instance, that's a great example. It started as a payments functionality, but then it's rebundled with Stripe, Relay, Stripe, Atlas. Uh, it, it tried a pay with Stripe button where on Twitter, you could go and pay with Stripe directly. Uh, it provides business in a box to the merchants. So that's an example where Stripe started with a vertical solution, unbundled, used that to gain the uh, merchant account, and then started rebundling to serve the merchant. Square is another example. Started with payments, then realized that from there, initially it thought that it wanted to make a two-sided market, build a cash app, did not see customer uptake, but then rebundled around the merchant again to do payroll, you know, do other kinds of pieces, uh, including a, a Square card, loans, etc. So. My key point is that unbundling is the natural consequence of every wave of technology. And it's happening right now with the Gen AI wrapper startups. A wrapper is fundamentally unbundling a foundational model into a specific use case. That's what it does, right? And essentially, as an unbundler, you do not have the right to win because you do not have a way to protect that profit pool. In order to protect it, you need to get that control point. The moment you get that control point, 
the natural logical step is then to rebundle because once you establish the right to that user, if the user across the sea of potential options has chosen to establish an exclusive relationship with you, non-multi-homing, that means you have the right to rebundle. So value then comes through to the rebundlers. So if you look at all the fintechs that eventually eventually succeeded and generated venture returns, they never stayed at just unbundling. They have, they've always rebundled and done it really well. So one of my favorite theories is, is around contract theory. So it, with the contract theory basically defines that uh, boundaries of bundles or organizations, even companies are defined by contracts. Yep. And as long as the friction uh, inside of those contract boundaries is less than the friction outside of those boundaries, uh, then it will remain intact. It will remain bundled. Or, and then as those transaction costs shift over time, so digitalization takes uh, transaction costs down, uh, up somewhere, they shift. That also means that the, uh, the unbundling kind of element uh, starts. So let's take this uh, thought experiment to the, to the extreme. Now, we're seeing a lot of uh, movement now in terms of transaction cost, uh, cost lowering, uh, uh, having common infrastructure for things like digital identity and signatures, basically digitizing a lot of these uh, boundaries of, of, of even organizations. Uh, the, uh, so, I mean, kind of with that extreme thinking, let's say that transaction cost for everything related to contracting goes to close to zero with digital contracts, and we have really low transaction costs. Uh, um, is this going to change the world? I mean, is everything going to be unbundled before it rebundles again? And uh, how do you see the future of companies in this uh, unbundled world? Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, the, the key thing is that when, um, um, so I, I don't think we're doing anything fantastical and taking this to the extreme. I think these uh, 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 scenarios are important to run through because transaction costs are consistently falling with every new technological wave. Um, what's important is that they are counterbalancing forces as well. Yes, when transaction costs fall, your natural instinct is to think that everything will get unbundled. The reason everything does not stay unbundled is because unbundling increases another form of transaction cost, which is not at the contract, it's at the search. You now have to figure out of this wide sea of different options at every layer of the value chain, how, who do you plug in for every specific functionality? So at some point, you need somebody to resolve that search cost for you, right? So assume that everything in the world is a fintech, and now I'm a, I'm a consumer, and uh, I go to one fintech, and they say, well, you know what, we'll do this particular thing, but to do this other thing, there are 10 different options, and you can click, and we'll connect the API and make it happen. For me, that's too much you know, to, to work through, but it's not just about the consumer, it's about the developer, it's about every level of the value chain at every interface. If instead of curated options, you have hundreds of options, that becomes a challenge. And so what rebundling, you know, what then ends up happening is the, the forcing function shifts away from friction in the contract to, I won't say friction, but the ability to detain the relationship. When everybody gets unbundled, Whoever emerges as the key player who retains the critical relationship in a market that they are operating in, closer to the customer, it's the customer relationship. Away from the customer, it's a developer relationship at different points in the value chain. If you are, you know, in the API game, uh, further down, it's the merchant relationship, etc. So the key relationship, if you are able to get access to that, and if you are able to establish yourself as the purveyor of that relationship. That then gives you the right to the bundle. So we will always, with every new shift in technology, see more unbundling happening. And we will always need a way to resolve those costs through somebody who now owns the new quote unquote friction, but it's really the new right to the relationship that will help you, them to the bundle. So I think that's that's critical. Uh, there's another way to the bundle, which is not relationship based. And that is that you own the key performance driver in a certain market. And I'll give a simple example of this. Um, if you look at you know Google, Google, when Android was launched, it got rapidly unbundled. Android was launched and uh, handset manufacturers could come and they could create their own version of Android by forking it. And then they could create their own app store, which, which worked with their own version of Android. So in 2012, right when I was starting this, Apple was doing well, but Google had like this fragmentation problem. Every version of Android was different. And then Google realized it had to be the player that rebundles everything. The app store has to sit at that level. And so what was their right to rebundling? They had a unique advantage in a key performance layer called Google Maps. 
right? So if you are if you have a handset, you need navigation. Otherwise, you can't run Uber. You can't run any navigation uh, without uh, maps on it. And Google essentially said, as a handset manufacturer, if you want maps, you need to come and work with us on our terms, not on your unbundled version of Android. And so maps became a control point in that ecosystem. So what I'm trying to get to is you need to look for those specific pieces in the ecosystem. It's a relationship of, with the key player. It's a key uh, you know, performance layer that, without which things break down. That allows you to start rebundling. So rebundling will happen wherever the unbundling happens for precisely the reasons I laid out. So an, an interesting sort of follow on from that, if we look back at, at banking and fintechs and the unbundling that most sort of fintechs have done, and now we're starting to look at rebundling again, from my perspective, particularly for the traditional banks, one of the largest value units is trust, right? And the relationship with the customers. Admittedly, yes, a lot of fintechs and neo banks have got customers, but do they have the same level of trust and and historical uh, focus like like the large banks? Does this mean that as we start seeing rebundling, the legacy banks and traditional banks are actually prime positioned to be the the bundling? Uh, organizations here and therefore take over control or back control again from the fintech disruption? So that's that's a great, really, really important point that needs to be clarified for banks because sometimes trust becomes a catch-all term. You just say that because we have the brand, we have trust and so we win. The starting point is there's a distinction between trust in your organization and the trust that you can impute in the market. Hmm. As I said, I don't just trust Airbnb. I also trust, more importantly, it's five-star host rating, right? I don't just trust TripAdvisor. I trust, more importantly, it's five-star rating for a hotel. That becomes the industry standard, right? So I think that's the key. The reason I trust that rating is because enough people have gone to those places and have felt that the experience was consistent with the rating, and I now trust the, the wisdom of the crowd with respect to that rating. So that's just one way to impute trust in the market through the wisdom of the crowd. There are many other ways to impute trust in the market. You know, in financial services, you could create a fundamentally new way to do credit scoring that nobody else has done before. And that would be a new way to impute trust in who should be given credit to and who should not be given credit to. The problem when banks say that they have trust is that they're always talking about organizational trust, trust in the organization. They haven't displayed or they haven't demonstrated a way to impute that trust into the market. Mm -hmm. And so until they do that, you know, as a bank, how I, if I play in the, going back to the house example, if I play in the, just purchase the house, want to renovate the house position, uh, am I the right person to impute trust in the contractor than the interior designers? Should I even be doing that? If not, trust as I see it, will not help with that market interaction. Either I find a different market interaction where trust can be used as a weapon or as a value unit, or I go for this market interaction realizing that trust is not going to be a way to for me to uh, uh, you know drive value in that transaction. So it's very important to understand which market interactions you can impute trust to, which ones you cannot impute trust to. Uh, there are other ways to think about using your trust uh, when you know as it pertains to your organization. Um, one example of this is, um, you know, there's a you know, large pet foods company that I've worked with, and uh, they essentially um, came to the realization that they could not, they did not have the data to compete with, uh, you know, the new providers of pet tech. If you look at pet food, it's secondary demand. The primary demand is I want my pet to be healthy. And there, a lot of pet tech players are playing, you know, connected collars, uh, um, connected litter boxes, etc. So they instead said, we don't have the data, but we have the brand. Let's use this brand to negotiate better investment deals and then license our brand to these players and then drive them through our distribution channel. It's still not imputing trust in the market, but you're imputing trust in your partners. Your partners are then creating the rating systems to impute trust in the market. And so you're playing with that whole game. So I think that's the key point. You need to figure out how do you move from trust in the organization to we are able to impute trust in the market transactions that happen around me. There's so, so many parallels to, for example, how the blockchain world has evolved, uh, the crypto world has evolved uh, from kind of full decentralization, be your own bank kind of thinking, yet coming back to being rebundled, 
to trusted organizations because ultimately people would want to deal with their own own crypto and all of that stuff. They'd rather trust somebody to take care of all of it for them. We've had so many discussions about this on the podcast before, so I'm really kind of in, uh, in, interested to see these uh, parallels uh, to a lot of these discussions. But uh, as we're kind of rapidly uh, running out of time here, I want to round off the discussion uh, with a brief discussion about the ethics uh, of platforms in general and what, what you need to consider in this space. Because one of the themes that we've seen over the last decade with the emergence of these super platforms uh, that we all recognize uh, is really the ethics uh, of, of around those. So when you do achieve that position to be a dominant platform provider, uh, they get accused of what they call digital feudalism, uh, basically uh, uh, profiteering from uh, from the providers on those platforms. And there's a lot of these negative discussions where we've all heard in, in so many medias before. So from your perspective, what, what is your guidance and advice on, on both sides of this discussion? So being a platform provider, how do you create a fair platform uh, with ethical thinking behind it? And then as a provider for platforms, how do you identify the places that are good for your products? Yeah, I think, um, you know, um... I'll just state my position on this, which, uh, you know, ho hopefully that, you know, I, 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 um, uh, I learn enough to change this position over time, but my position about ethics is just this, that you cannot solve for ethics by solving for ethics alone. The only way to solve for ethics is by solving for incentives and power structures. Mm -hmm. uh, given the right level of power and given the right incentives, ethics stop mattering to companies. Because if you have sufficient power and sufficient incentives to use that in certain ways, you are going to move in that direction and start using it. And that's what we've seen with 300 to 400 years of corporate history. I don't see that going away easily until you start, you stop just shouting at companies to start being ethical and start figuring out systemic solutions to attack those incentives and power structures, right? And so if you think of that, my my current work, which is the, you know, uh, my current body of work, which on which I'm writing a book as well, uh, essentially is about understanding this four step shift in incentives and power structures in the platform economy. The first step is always unbundling. Okay, you move from a vertically integrated contract driven firm to an unbundled situation, then you rebundle. What happens after rebundling is now the industry is no longer vertical, it's horizontal. Stripe is a horizontal, you know, a, a bank in a box cloud, industry cloud is a horizontal, and further up other players are horizontal, like Facebook, Amazon, uh, PayPal. But once you reach this horizontal position, what ends up happening is that we start seeing something which I call sandwiching. You, you now have the value chain like a sandwich, and these horizontal players start squeezing you right? They squeeze you in different ways. They may say, Amazon may say, hey, merchants below me, I've got the customer access. I have Prime. I'm going to make you fight for the buy box. I'm going to ensure that you charge the least over here. That's sandwiching. You're squeezing profits away and you are becoming thicker. They are becoming thinner, right? Another way to sandwich is that I could be AWS or Azure or any of these companies that I see all the companies above me are building the same thing. I want to, you know, build that and take it away from all of them. And that happens all the time. You know, uh, uh, Twitter sees that Meerkat is coming up. So it, it buys Periscope and stops Meerkat. So absorbing functionality away from other players building on top of you is again, shifting profits in your direction. So what ends up happening is when you rebundle, the logical next step, if you don't control for power is you start seeing this sandwiching happening. And over time, in addition to sandwiching, you also have selective vertical integration. I may, I may, own a horizontal, but I may say, I, you know, I'm Amazon, I own the marketplace, but I also want to own that category and that category, but not all these other categories. That's selective vertical integration. Because of your God view, you are able to determine which part of the market you want to own and nobody else can deal with that. So my point is, before we uh, start solving for ethics, we need to solve for these issues. How do you prevent sandwiching? How do you prevent the selective stacking? And the answer to all this lies in one step before this happens, what's the control point? If you can identify the control point, you need to start regulating the control point. Can Stripe be allowed to own all merchant identities or should merchant identity become um, you know, a shared uh, resource which can be managed by country level cooperators, et cetera, right? I mean, those are the kinds of questions we need to start thinking about. I'm not saying that's the right answer, but my point is we need to start thinking about the the ethics problem at the point of the control point should google maps be allowed to be completely owned or should maps become 
you know, uh, a, a, a fundamental utility, foundational utility. A lot of all the innovation that has happened in the US has been on top of foundational utilities built by the government. The government built the internet, the government built the financial system. But then when you build a horizontal layer on top of it, you then start getting the ability to start sandwiching. So until you solve for that, you can't solve for ethics. And I think that's the concern. Hmm. Having said that, you need to ensure that you need to understand that market participants themselves have a way to self-regulate, but there are limits to that self-regulation. For example, you know, Amazon has to be fair to a certain extent to the merchants, but you can't just say that unless it's fair to the merchants, the merchants will move away. There are many different control points that Amazon has, like the, you know, the price matching algorithm where it matches the same product on different sites, so which it controls the merchant. But to some extent, it has to be nice to the merchant. So a regulator should not over-regulate. They need to understand to what extent is the platform already providing a fair market and what are the points at which that fairness is going away and then start regulating those pieces and the control points around that. Mm -hmm. So I think those are the key issues, right? I mean, instead of going to Amazon and saying, let's be fair to merchants, you need to figure out a way to regulate the price matching algorithm. What are the conditions under which that's allowed versus not allowed? I think that's you know my overall point of view that Solving for ethics is our fundamental goal, but we need to do that within the understanding of how power structures and incentives stack up. Once we understand that, there are systemic ways to start solving for ethics. Well, that is a really important theme to end up on because, again, we have a saying in this podcast, which is time flies when you're having fun. And <laughs> it really, really okay. has flown uh, this time. I feel we could go on for at least another eight hours on all of these topics easily. But uh, so unfortunately, we're out of time, so we have to round it off uh, for, for this episode. But before we do, uh, was there anything that you wanted to talk about that we didn't get a chance to talk about? I know you mentioned your upcoming book, uh, maybe something about that yeah i think you know in general um, my upcoming body of work is on this topic i i feel that um, there's a bigger story around the platform economy beyond just the rise of platforms and that is this uh, move towards unbundling rebundling sandwiching and then stacking so this whole piece is what i call sandwich economics you need to understand how that sandwiching works if you don't understand the principles of how that works you are going to kind of be sandwiched in between and you're going to start applying ethics, but you won't really figure out how to solve for those issues. Uh, so that's my overall body of work. I mean, I, I write about that every week at my newsletter. It's platforms.substack.com. Uh, you can follow it over there. Yeah, my website is platformthinkinglabs.com where I write about all these issues as well. And uh, yeah, I mean, before the book, I would uh, I am looking to you know bring out this idea more in a short uh, really cute explainer video to kind of help people understand how the sandwiching works and what to do about it. And so uh, that that should come out later this month. And so that'll be the start of that journey towards bringing out this body of work. That's fantastic. And there you heard it already, how you can get in touch. But uh, is there any other medium uh, that our listeners can get in touch with you if they want to learn more? I think feel free to connect and follow on LinkedIn. I uh, you know regularly post over there. Um, I, my, I'm happy to drop my email as well, which you can add uh, below the podcast at sangeetatplatformthinkinglabs.com. Um, but yeah, I think those are the best avenues to get in touch through. Great. So thank you so much for this episode. I think this was a long but well worth it uh, time for our listeners, and I, I think they will agree. And on that note, uh, if you did like this episode, if you liked any of the episodes we've done before, do drop us a review, uh, like, subscribe, the usual things we always talk about, because that really helps, especially if you write a review or a comment that really helps uh, new listeners to discover our podcast and the content that we're doing here. Uh, pro bono, to be, to be fair, no ads in this podcast. <laughs> so uh, Thank you for listening again. Uh, we will see you in a few weeks time. Paul and I will be now heading off to the uh, beautiful autumn of Finland. Thank you. This has been Fintech Daydreaming. This is Fintech Daydreaming. <laughs>